I want to welcome you guys to Grace Bible Fellowship. Let's pray. Father, your grace is wonderful. And we are so glad that you're in our lives. We know that all things do work together for good. For those that love you, for the called according to your purpose. And yet, Lord, there are many who are sick. I pray that you touch them. That you might bring them to full health. That you might show your purposes in all of this. I pray that today, as we come before you, that our hearts would be open, that our minds would be ready to understand, our ears to hear new and wonderful things about you. I thank you for those that are here. Lord, make it a special blessing today by having your spirit fall upon this place, that as we talk about your word, that it might be meaningful, purposeful, and that you might take a greater acreage in our hearts. So, Lord, we're here. We pray that you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, how's everybody doing? Looks like we have another surge of uh, COVID coming through. I don't feel so bad. I had it in February, so I'm good. Well, we are back in the book of Romans. We're in chapter 8, and we, we picked up on verse 28 last week, and that's the only verse I did, and it took me all day. So we're going we're gonna to move on from there, and we're going to pick 831 as our verse for today. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? It, it should really say, since then, God is with us. What shall we say? Since God is for us, who can be, with, who can be against us? The answer is nobody. We're in the book of Romans, just uh, coming quickly to the end of chapter 8. We won't finish today, probably next week, but we're moving in on that, and then we're going to talk about Israel and God's past, present, and future dealings with Israel and his plan. Beginning from verse 28 in chapter 8 of Romans, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn, uh, firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these also he glorified. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This is one of the most precious and most argued about section of scripture that I know. And as we go through it, I'm going to do my best to define it in the original language and throughout the text of the scriptures so that we have a fuller understanding of what the Bible teaches. Last week, we looked at verse 28, which was enough, uh, just, just that one verse. And we looked at Abraham and Joseph and David and Job and how all of these folks in the Old Testament understood this principle that God works all these things out for good. Job, as he had all the times and the trials he had, he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He still had a faith in him. Abraham, he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So he believed God and knew that he was working something out, that his sovereignty and his love for human beings was there and present even in his life. And that was credited to him as righteousness. And Joseph, he says, you know, you meant these things to me for evil, but God meant it for good that he might save these people, that he might endure, and ultimately the Savior to come through that line. And we looked at David and how he said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. This 
kind of a, 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 a settled stance that God has your back, that God is for you, that he's not against you. And all of these great people in the faith understood that and had a deep abiding faith. And we discussed that last week. And ultimately, Jesus understood that there was a purpose for his coming. He says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But this, for this very purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus knew that he came, although struggling with his emotions, with his feelings, he decided to do the will of the Father and knew that this is one of those things that had to happen. He said, Lord, if this, Father, if this cup could pass from me, but not my will, thy will be done. Giving us an example of what it is to trust God in all of these situations and to understand that he's working all these things out for good, that he has a purpose, that his hand is involved in it. And especially today with all of the crazy things going on, I don't know about you, but this Thanksgiving was especially hard because I really had to look for things to be thankful for. And so I ended up playing the glad game uh, on Thanksgiving and really trying to dig deep and find things that I could be thankful for and see God's hand moving and to be thankful for all the things that happened. Beginning in verse 29, uh, fasten your seatbelts. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. First of all, God has foreknowledge, which means he knows things in advance. He knows eternity past and eternity forward. He has it all top of mind. He can neither forget nor can he learn. I'll let you think about that for just a minute. But I want to give you just a small reminder from the scripture before we get into this. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are things which we as human beings will try to lay hold of and lay a handle on, and yet because we are finite, we have a beginning, a middle, and ultimately in this body we have an end, but we will endure onward. We don't have an eternity past. There was a time in which you were born and, and you were created by God with a living soul. And he, he breathed into you the, the breath of life and you became a living being. You had a beginning. God had no beginning. And his memory reaches to the furthest extents of eternity. So for us to come to grasp with this is something that we're not going to be able to understand. I, I don't have a problem with understanding that God is and that he always will be. It's when I go back and I start thinking that he always was. And I keep looking for an end. And I don't understand that part. I mean, I can almost visualize continuing on and on and on. At least I thought I would live forget forever. Um, and so it's not that hard for me to figure out. But going all the way back and knowing that God always has been is a difficult thing. So before we get into these things, I'll just acknowledge that there are secret things that belong to God. How he works human will along with his selection and his predestination of us is a very difficult, very contested topic. But the scriptures, I think, are very clear. And the ones that we go through today, we'll look at. First of all, he foreknew. Do you know that God foreknew you? Do you know when he foreknew you? He always knew you. Before you were, he knew you. Like I said, secret things belong to God. Prognosco, which means that he always knew. He knew beforehand. He foresaw. He foreknew you long before you ever were. Here in Romans 11, 2, it says, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that the scripture says of Elijah that he pleads with God against Israel? God foreknows, and those he foreknows, he predestines. He foreknew you. Always understand that God's predestination and his election are tied to his foreknowledge. Not that he waits for you to have a right heart for him to move, but that he already knows everything about you. When you get this figured out, let me know. I want to see, the, I want to see it on a, on a chart. Revelation 13, verses 7 and 8, speaking of the beast who will come, says, also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. 
and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. He's talking about in the end times when uh, we've been taken up. And yet there will still be people that get saved during that tribulation period. And those are the saints. Notice that he doesn't make war upon the church. He makes war upon the saints. And it says, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So there is a book where God has written your name. He wrote your name before you were. He wrote and understood everything that you would ever do before you ever did anything. He knew every word that you would speak before you ever spoke it and you were written down in the Lamb's book of life. If you're his, and if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're his. It's just working out the details on this side. 1 Peter 1.20 says, He is indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Speaking of Jesus, he was foreordained to come and die for your sin before sin ever infected the earth. Jesus came and died by the express plan of God. It wasn't a failure. People think Jesus came, he taught a lot of people, tried to give them the light, they didn't hear it. He really wanted to have a wife and children and repopulate the earth with righteous people. There are people who say such things, but they don't know the scriptures. They have wild imaginations and they believe in science fiction. But... He was foreordained before the foundation of the world to come and be a sacrifice for us. In Psalm 139, 16, your eyes saw my substance yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God has a book all about your life. He's got the first chapter and he has the last chapter already written. And he knows everything about you. All of the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's a comforting and a, dis and a discomforting thing. He knows all about it. And because he is without time and he stands outside of time, he sees your life as a, as a done deal. That's why I can say that God has done all these things in the past tense. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Isn't it interesting to think that God prepared footsteps for you before you ever stepped in those spots? There were things that he prepared in advance that you should walk in them before you ever came to know Christ. I just find that amazing. And these thoughts aren't designed by God to perplex us, but to give us a sense of security and value and importance that God made sure that every little detail of your life was taken care of, that he put you in New Jersey, God help you. He put you in New Jersey, knowing that your life would be the way that it is. I don't know about you, but I start to look back on some of the crummy things. They say, hey, God, how come? If you're in charge of everything, how come? And you know what? He gives you an answer, and he'll tell you how come. There are reasons why we go through the things that we go through. And if nothing else, it draws us closer to him, doesn't it? I wouldn't have known Christ except that I was extremely lost. If I didn't get to the point where I was completely lost, uh, I wouldn't have turned to the Lord because I would have had no need. If I didn't see my sin as black as it was, I wouldn't see Christ as white as he is. Another one about God's foreknowledge here in Acts 2, 22 to 23. Men of Israel, hear these words. This is Peter preaching. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. What a wonderful balanced passage that is. 
because what it does is it talks about God's foreknowledge that Jesus Christ was actually given by God the Father to us. And yet, there's a personal responsibility you have taken by lawless hands and you have crucified and put him to death. Peter is pointing the finger at the people and calling them responsible, even though God was from eternity past foreordained Christ to come and die. So there are things that God has planned, and yet it does not alleviate you of personal responsibility, does it? I just thought I'd show you that. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And if you're reading the King James, it's predestinated. They, they like more letters. It is pro, pro oizo. Pro oizo. In the, in the original Greek, that's what it means. It means to set a limit in advance. It means to predetermine. It determined beforehand to ordain or predestinate. God made up his mind early on that you were going to be his before you did anything. Any of you struggle with that thought? Just me. Good. Well, so why did he pick you? Why did he pick anybody? Amen. The problem with predestination is it goes against our American nature of uh, I do what I want. <laughs> I'm free. I can do what I want. No, you can't. You can't fly without the aid of an airplane, obviously. There are many things you can't do. You can't run faster than a bear. There are lots of things you can't do, and you have certain limitations. So guess what? God is in the business of making up his own mind to do whatever he wants to do because he feels like it. And he has his reasons and those secret things we may not know. Does that disquiet you? Well, if you're wondered if you're one of the predestined, all you have to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ and believe in him and you'll be saved. That's what the scripture says. And you'll be predestined. Or don't do it and wait until you stand before the Lord and then you'll know you weren't. So if you're worried about it, do something. But the scripture teaches that God preordains, he predestines. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. God chose you, picked you, predestined you. Before the world was created, he knew you and chose you. That gives me a great sense of importance and of security. Because if God went through all this trouble and he picked me long before he ever knew me, and he did all of this before I ever was, what are the chances he's going to give up on you? Zero. It, I'm just telling you, if you can't do the math, it's pretty much zero. And Ephesians 1.11 says, And him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. You get the idea, God's got it rigged. He's got it all under control. So what if I don't feel like things are under control? What if I look around and the things that I see indicate with loud ferocity that things are not under control, that things are out of control, that there are things happening that should not happen, uh, that are impossible, that are, are unthinkable? Well, then I'm wrong. Because it says that he's got it rigged. He knows. Before it ever happened, he knew it would happen. This whole election, he knew it would happen. In fact, I wonder if he isn't causing these things to be brought up so they get dealt with. I praise God for it. Well, what about that Wuhan virus, Pastor Dave? 
that snuck out, you know. No, I really believe that God has it rigged. And I'm not worried about it. And I think that's what the scripture's trying to tell us. You really have nothing to worry about. Anybody who worries, number one, it's a sin. And number two, you're not believing. That God predestined, he's got it figured out. Your salvation is a done deal. It's done. God's proclaimed decree from eternity is that you are his. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, because there's no one who seeks him. No, not one. There's none who are righteous. There are none who pursue God. No one. There's no one acceptable before God uh, on their own merit. It's only if God does the work and he predestines it. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, made into the image or made into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you, if you don't know that, that is the purpose of why God still has you here and he hasn't taken you home. It's because like bread that's not quite done, you got to go back in because you're not finished. I, I mean, some of you might be, but I know I'm not. So that's why I'm still here with you nice people. It means that we're going to be conformed and fashioned into the image of Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how do we understand the will of God? It's from having a transformed mind and not being conformed to the image of this world. We're not being pressed into the world's mold so that we look like somebody in the world. We're being pressed into the mold of Jesus Christ so that we look like him. Amen? And we have a responsibility here. This isn't something God just declares poof, you're sanctified. Wouldn't that be good? That'd be great. Take the wrinkles out, you know, <laughs> shave a little from the middle, I'd, you know, stretch me out a foot or so. That'd be great. But it happens as we die. You see, that's our responsibility as Christians. It's not that we need to do better, try harder, you know, pull up your bootstraps, boy. And, you know, that's not it. It's about dying. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. So you know how you cooperate with God? You die. You die to yourself, you die to the world, and you live for him. And that's the best thing we can do for God is die. <laughs> is just get out of his way and stop fighting him. Sanctification and transformation is the cooperative work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, which requires our dying to reflect the likeness of Christ. Notice this is something we have to do. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. So for me to even have a willingness for God to do a repair on my heart and my mind is a work of the Holy Spirit. And that's something that we can resist, by the way. It says that we shouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit by which we've been sealed into the day of redemption, that we're supposed to yield ourselves and not be pressed into the world's mold. That's something we have to do, by the way, is die <laughs> and get out of his way. And that's the greatest thing that we could do in a cooperative effort with the Lord, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, so that we all look like Jesus and he leads us in a parade. The firstborn, by the way, doesn't mean that he was the first created. It means he has the place of prominence. It's, it's much more of a prominent thing than it is uh, that he was a created being. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, those he also justified. And in whom he justified, these he also glorified. A lot of terms. So, kaleo is the word for called. He calls. It's like an invitation. It's like, hey, you. And by the way, when God calls you, he calls you by name. He doesn't put out a universal call. He puts out an individual call and calls you by name. I find that amazing. He knows you intimately and he invites you and calls you. In fact, the scriptures teach us that 
that is vitally important that the father be involved in that process or it won't, won't happen. In John 6, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on that day. Jesus said, you can't come to me unless the father draws you. So who is the one who's responsible for your salvation? God, holy and completely. Because without that, we would just be completely lost. Jesus says in John 6, 64 to 66, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked with him no further. Jesus spoke to them about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and they freaked out. And he says, listen, don't let it bother you. If you hear my, if you hear my words, because the Father's drawing you, and if not, then not. So what do you do about that? There's not much you can do about it. It's God's sovereignty. The question is, has God spoken to you? Has God drawn you to Jesus Christ? Is he truly your Savior and your Lord? If so, you can experience all these things and understand them, and it's a wonderful comfort. So where does preaching the gospel come? Well, there's a whole bunch of scriptures that says that's exactly what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to share this with other people because you don't know what God's doing, right? He calls. In 2 Timothy 1.9 says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. I don't know about you, these are some of the most mind-blowing scriptures that, that I can think of. That God knows about you before there was ever time, before you ever existed, before he started the stopwatch of time, that he selected you in Christ Jesus. In 2 Peter 1.10 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. We are called and elected. Scripture is very, very clear about that, which puts the onus on God to do the work. And it doesn't give us any room to boast. However, I would like to say, well, there was a time in which God spoke to me and I was so smart, I decided to listen. It was my free will. It was my strength, my inner wisdom who made me select God. Listen, we're all lost, <laughs> and we need a Savior. <laughs> Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. When I was a young man, I felt God calling me into the ministry, and so I went to Bible college after I got married and after I had one daughter. And in the midst of going through college, I ended up having a son, and I felt like I was really called to be in the ministry. And yet... It took until I was 50 years old before I became a pastor of a church. I was involved in lots of ministry, doing things in various places, and yet I never was a pastor of a church that I could say this is my church. I've been the assistant pastor, a youth leader, worship leader, all those other things, but I was never the pastor. And I felt that's, that's what God called me in when I was in my early 20s and I went to school. And there were times when I wondered, God, is this ever going to happen? Is this really something that you want me to do? Or is this just an idea, figment of my imagination or some inflated ego trip? Or what is it? And what it was is God gave me a calling and a gift, and he said it's going to happen. And I have to turn to the scripture very often to remember that. Because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. If God has spoken to you something that he said he's going to do, he's going to do it. Now, you can cooperate with him or not. But that's what we do. The best thing we can do is die to ourselves. Verse 14, any of you who want to get in a, in a really good challenge, Bible challenge, I just want to leave this with you. In Matthew 22, Jesus gives a parable 
about a wedding feast. And at the wedding feast, he says this, for many are called, but few are chosen. So for a homework assignment, for any of you good studious students, you can take this back and then let me know what you think he's talking about. Jules Johnson, God bless America. Verses two to 14. The question is, who are the called and who are the chosen in the parable that Jesus is referring to? And are they the same? Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there for those of you who want a little extra credit. Whom he called, these also he justified. If you remember what justification is, it's dikayou, to render or to show regard as just or innocent, to freely justify or to be righteous. That Jesus justifies you, that he already did it. Justified is when a judge declares you innocent just as if you never sinned. And yet God doesn't tell us that we're innocent. He justifies us, which says the guilt that we think that we possess and that we're guilty of, that we have to pay for, God has already taken and taken it upon his own son and died. That's what justification is just as if I'd never sinned. And so he did this to those who were called, who were selected, predestined, and those he had foreknowledge of, he justifies. Notice the one he begins a work in, he doesn't finish until it's all over and you're glorified. So there are people who struggle with, hey, could I lose my salvation? Could I misplace it like my car keys? Or could I throw it away? A relationship that you did not earn, that you don't deserve, that was brought and given to you by God. Can you get rid of that? Can you slough off God and say, I don't want anything to do with you? Well, it doesn't appear so from the passage. Because the passage tells me everybody that he foreknows, predestines, calls, he justifies. And whom he justified, he also glorified. By the way, it's in a past tense, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Romans 3, 23 to 25 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins which were previously committed. Through Jesus Christ and through his grace, we are justified freely. We don't pay for it. We don't earn it. We certainly don't deserve it. And aren't you glad that God didn't wait until that happened? Because that would not happen. In Galatians 2.16, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. There are basically two different types of religion. There's a religion which says, if you try hard, open your mind, do enough good stuff, you'll be acceptable before God and you'll break into karma or whatever it is and you'll be one with the universe. And every other religion says the very same thing, just in different terms. And yet, Christianity says, it's already been done, all you need to do is go pick up a free gift, which has already been left for you. That is the difference between Christianity, true Christianity, being born again, and every other religion on the face of the planet where you have to work yourself up to some level, you know, or, or spend a lot of money to, to get up to a certain level in an organization, and that's gonna guarantee you eternal life. None of those things are true. And I'm glad for it because, you know, it's, it's something I can afford is nothing. That's exactly what I have in my budget of morality and perfection. And those he justified, he also glorified. By the way, that's the finished work of God. It's docadso. It's to render glorious or to glorify or to make full of glory, honor, and to magnify. Jesus 
glorifies the one that he foreknew, that he predestined, that he called, that he justified, that he glorified. You see, you don't start the process and end somewhere in the middle or jump off the track. It's a, it's a continuous process. And I think the scripture before in verse 28 says, all things work together for good is there right before all this to show God's got it. We don't have anything to worry about. We don't have to stress on it. We can really look to him because he will finish what he started. Philippians 3, 20 to 21 says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. He is going to take us and he is going to change us and make us like himself. If you remember when Jesus rose, spoke to the disciples, he would just show up. Doors locked, windows barred. Jesus just said, peace be with you. <laughs> and there he was. And then all of the post-resurrection uh, climactic events when Jesus would show up always involved food. First thing, he shows up and one week, one week after, hey, peace be with you. you. You got some fish? You got some bread? He sits down and eats and the disciples are all, he sits down and has a meal with them. And he goes, go ahead, touch me. I'm, I'm flesh and blood. A ghost doesn't have flesh and blood like you see, I have. And he sits down and eats. And I love that. And then poof, he's gone. He's on the road to Emmaus. He says, why are you so slow to hard to believe all that the scriptures have said that the Messiah must suffer? And he began with the law of Moses and the prophets and he discussed everything concerning himself. And then he continued on as though he were going on and these guys turned in and they said, you know, it's late. Why don't you come in? Not realizing it was Jesus. And Jesus comes in and he breaks the bread. There's food. In John chapter 21, Jesus is walking along the shore and Peter decided to go back to his old ways and backslide into fishing for fish instead of men and catches him and says, do you have any food? Always food. So I don't feel so bad. I think I'll be okay in heaven. But you see, he is going to transform our lowly body to be conformed like his. So he had a physical body, a real body. Although there were things that he could do that you and I couldn't do, like just appear and disappear. I'm looking forward to that. John 17, 22 to 24 says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given to them. This is Jesus in his um, dissertation about the church and, and the disciples in chapter 17. That they may be one just as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, and you love me before the foundation of the world. Jesus says that he has given the glory which you gave to me, I have given to them. What is that? For extra, extra credit. What is the glory that Jesus left? And this is before he was ascended. What is the glory that Jesus has left? Because you have it according to the scriptures. So, anyway, just to sum up, this is, this is this wonderful chain, these five things which are listed in the scripture. He called, I'm sorry, he foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, and he glorified. So what did you do? in this process of getting saved. What did you do? If it was God who foreknew, who predestined, who called, 
who justified and who glorified, by the way, notice it's a past tense because as far as God's concerned, because he's without time, it's a done deal. What did you do? You received a free gift, which makes it the best news that you could tell anybody who's lost and separated from God. You can be reconciled to God because God did all the work and it is finished. Jesus said so on the cross. So God did all this for you. Notice it is he who foreknew, it was he who predestined the image of his son. Notice how prominent God is in this passage. And there's very little of us involved except for us dying, of course. We just have to die. And we can't do that without God's help. So God did all this for you because there's no way any of us could do any of that for ourselves. This is a grand and gracious explanation of what God has done for you in Christ. Don't hear it with cold, biased ears of fine learning. This is the love, this is his love explained to you. Because there are people who will accept labels like Calvinist, Arminiast, and you will side on one of those and you, you will carry a label and you will read a passage like this and say, Pastor Dave's a Calvinist. <laughs> no, I'm a Jesus freak. I'll take that because I am not a disciple of any man. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I'd like to think myself a student of the word of God. I hope you're the same. Because I do believe that human choice and human will are mixed in there somewhere, I don't see it anywhere here, except for you dying, which is the greatest thing that we could do. Die to ourselves, give your life over, and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When he says jump, say how high. And that's the best thing that we can do. And draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, as the scripture says. That's the best thing we could do is avail ourselves of a free gift. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 to 7, gives this explanation of the people of God. For you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God, has chosen you to be a people for himself. That's true of you as well, isn't it? A special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Isn't that true? The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all the peoples. They're being told that God chose you not on the basis of how big you are, how smart you are, what you might do if you came to Christ. You know, I always like to think of famous people, and I think, man, wouldn't it be cool if God saved like Elton John or or Beyonce, or, uh, you know, the, Bruce Springsteen, or, you know, why couldn't God save somebody that could really have some influence in this world? Well, God doesn't pick people because they're popular. He doesn't pick people because of what they could do for him. In fact, I think he finds people that won't be confused about where the glory is coming from. <laughs> it's not coming from you, it's coming from him. And that's what he wants. So I think that's why he chose us. So summing up, this is uh, the Living Bible, a different version, so you get a little different idea. From the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him and all along he knew who would should become like his son so that his son would be the first with many brothers. And having chosen us, he called us to come to him. And when he came, he declared us not guilty, filled us with Christ's goodness, and gave us right standing with himself and promised us his glory. I like to read other versions sometimes because they seem different when you read them in a different version. For God knew his people in advance that he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Having, and having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. 
And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. I think this statement, especially coupled with verse 28, is designed to give us a level of intimacy and understanding about what God has done for us. And if you didn't have much to be thankful for this Thanksgiving, you got the after party today. Because we have a lot to be thankful for that God has done for us. So what do we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, really, if God did all of this, who could be against you? Uh, you could be like Jacob and say, oh, all these things are against me. There was a time when he got all excited and he said, oh, well, I'm in deep trouble, man. This is it. Life is over. My life is miserable. And yet, if God is for you, who can be against you? What, what are you going to say to all of this? And the thing is, there's not much to say except thank you or hallelujah, or thank you, Jesus. Because what else can you say? What do you contribute? You know, we don't contribute anything to our salvation. Our sanctification is something that certainly we can resist or not. But salvation is something that God gives as a free gift. And if you feel God tugging on your heart and you don't know him, you can receive him today. If you know him, then you should be secure. You should not be worrying about anything. COVID, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. The Gentiles worry about all such things. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God gave the gift of his son as a sacrifice for you and for me. Could he have given anything more valuable? Could he have done anything more dramatic? To satisfy his own justice, because sin has got to be punished, you can't let sinners get away with stuff. That's the problem of governments. They favor some and not others. And when you do that, you ruin the whole world. If God were to just wink at you and think that your sin was okay and everyone else is going to get punished but not you, then he would not be righteous. He would not be just. Somebody has to die. And it was Jesus who came for you. If God gave his son, do you think he's going to withhold anything from us? Anything of value, anything that's good, anything that is necessary for your daily living or anything that is good for you? Do you think he would withhold anything from you if he gave his son? That's the point. He won't. God is for us, boys and girls. He is not an angry God looking to throw a lightning bolt and just policing. He seeks our good, and he has done all of this for us. The brutality that happened to Jesus was for you. It's the punishment that you and I deserve. And yet, God came in the person of his son and took it upon himself. Why are we not the most thankful people on the face of the planet? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that, we might be the first, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Father, as we stand in awe before your word and before these sacred and very heavy truths, I pray that you might help us, Lord, to be worthy recipients of the free gift, that we would live our lives in such a way as to prove our calling and election from you. 
Not everyone knows you, Lord, and I know that. And I pray for them right now that you might open their eyes and give them new life because of your son, Jesus Christ, that they would be those that you foreknew and predestined and called and justify and glorify. Lord, help us to walk in your word, to be a right reflection of you, that we might respond in a way that is worthy of our calling. In Jesus' name, amen.